What's the first rule of Fight Club? That's right. However, first rule of Mobility Fight Club is we talk about it every single day at AMC. And first rule, the second rule of Fight Club then is victory in the Pacific based on what we're doing at AMC. So I'm Colonel Phil Shea, I'm the Chief of the Plans and Strategies Division at Headquarters AMC. And I want to go through a little story about what Fight Club is, get a little bit deeper in the details that General Minahan kind of previewed in his speech yesterday, talk about how Air Mobility Command as a staff is putting resources in your hands to get ready to compete, deter, and, and win if necessary in a fight in the Pacific. Talk about the campaign plan that's kind of directing those activities and the culminating uh, event in that campaign, campaign plan in the next two years, Exercise Mobility Guardian in the summer of 2023. We'll have some other experts get up and talk about those pieces in there. I'm going to take you through just that little bit of the story that starts from the threat leading us into the strategy, leading us into a campaign plan, leading us into the demonstrations that we're doing in there. And you've seen this slide already from General Minahan. This is what the threat environment looks like in the Western Pacific. This is what an aggressive People's Republic of China Army has built up to to counter the American way of war and the asymmetric advantage that air mobility and our joint force can do to win and fight in the way we've fought in the last 20 years and what we demonstrated throughout the world. They have designed this force to go after our advantages, to go after the things that we do to make the joint force effective. That's the threat that we have to fight. You heard Secretary Kendall say it this morning already, his priority is China, China, China. So that's what we're looking at. However, you also heard General Minahan say that we are not ready to fight and win inside the first island chain. General Olvin was talking about General Brown's charge to us is we gotta accelerate change or lose. So that's where the Mobility Fight Club comes in is we will be ready in August of 2023. Again, that's Exercise Mobility Guardian. And what you're gonna hear about is what the command is doing and focus itself around this threat and the ability to get ready and take care of business. So when General Minahan came into the command, he said the strategy that AMC had was pretty good. There were no changes. You're gonna hear more about how the Mobility Fight Club came together and we did actually narrow down into gaps into other particulars. But when you talk about the strategy of the line from the national security strategy to the national defense strategy, including General Brown's Accelerate Change and Win, and then our updated strategy came out in March because we really focused in a narrow that says we are looking at that pacing threat in China. And as a lead MAGCOM, an investment MAGCOM, and as a component MAGCOM to US Transportation Command, we've got three roles to carry this strategy between today and the next two years and in the future. And those command vectors, which are basically gonna become our campaign plan objectives, as the things that we need to center around to develop airmen and families, advance those war fighting, war fighting capabilities, project and connect the joint force, and ensure strategic advantage for the nation all around the pacing threat that China presents to us. So the command strategy is four pages, pretty easy. You see that winning language that's in there? And so with the Fight Club bid has come together and took that strategy, took the threat that's sitting out there, and took General Minahan's intent and said, hey, these are things we must do as a mobility force. Command and control anywhere. Conduct navigation, maneuver under attack, and do it at a tempo to win. We have to do that in a multi-domain contested environment you see right there. We have to do it day to day, and we are doing it day to day. And General Minahan would say he's got gaps in there. Again, as we looked at it, those are the things we must do, and there are gaps we've identified. And it just depends on where and when those gaps find themselves. You look at all that red, and we see opportunity when Mobility Fight Club comes together to counter that. We had to identify those gaps, and this is where the partnership and education needs to come into it. And We talk about in those areas, if we fix gaps in connectivity, it's going to lead to fixing gaps in survivability, which is going to make our airmen and our forces more agile for the joint force, but understand there's gaps and we have to address viability because the force that we have today is the one that we're going to go to war with. In five years, it's still going to be KC-135s and KC-46s. In 10 years, it's still going to be KC-135s and KC-46s. So the fleet that we have is going to continue the fight. It's the capabilities based around closing these gaps, conduct these imperatives that the command is looking at and trying to put those resources into your hands, into the leader's hands, and make sure you're ready for that fight. So we take the four-page strategy that is enduring from today into the future uh, programs, 
and get down to the tangibles of what we need to do to prioritize and make those choices, we went into a campaign plan. I'd like to introduce Colonel Gio Monaco from the 16th, 618th AOC who helped create that campaign plan. Thanks, Phil. Hey, how you doing? I'm Joe Monaco. Thank you. I go by Gio. To some in the room, apparently Gino. Maybe it's because I'm Italian and I like pizza. I work at the 618th Air Operations Center in the strategy director. I'm also a mobility troll and a member of the AMC Fight Club. I want to talk a little bit about the history of Fight Club. I know Colonel Shea just hit on the why, which is the strategy, and what we're getting after in Fight Club. But I want to rewind to September of last year when I was working in the A58X strategy branch. And we got a TMT tasker, a task management tool tasker, right, that came down and said, hey, we have a new commander coming in and he wants a spin up briefing on the following topics. And our coworkers in the shop kind of read them off and it, and it sounded like the, f the familiar list of topics in, in terms of KC-46 and POM and AFORGIN. And then the, they spoke up and said, but there's a question in here too. And it says, does AMC see a role in a high-end fight against the pacing threat, i.e. China? If so, how? And this is before I knew what let's go meant. I literally jumped out of my chair and I said, let's go. That's action order Charlie. Because while we had been doing gaps analysis for the last four months, think action order Delta that General Alvin hit on this morning for force design, which was oriented on the joint war fighting concepts and Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives and the six fights that the Air Force ceased to get in the theater and sustain it and to maneuver and so on and so forth. But this was different because the inbound commander wanted to know how we integrate into the joint fight at the air component level. It was a leading question. So what did we do? The day after he took command, we gave him a briefing after we brought in the A2 and we laid down the threat and we gave him how we fit into the joint scheme of maneuver at the secret level. What came out of that briefing was, hey, this is great, but I want you to take those gaps. I want you to put them on a map. I want you to go up to the war plan of record. I want you to make the assumptions from the AMC perspective that are nested within the higher assumptions. And I want you to tell me what is the essential elements that we do not give to our fielded forces to execute this fight in the context of those gaps that Colonel Shea just talked about and those four imperatives that we have to get after to fill those gaps. So what is strategy? I'm not gonna give all the definitions that are out there, but I will give my definition of strategy. It is an iterative process of applying the power and resources that you have available to gain and maintain relative positions of advantage. Some key words there, it's iterative. You do it over and over, there's a design element to it, there's a planning element, and then you execute and assess. It's a process, it's relative. Relative to whom? Adversaries, i.e. China. You have to keep doing it, it does not end. You have to create and generate effects. So while he said not to read the strategy and do your job, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I do want to talk about how we actually do strategy through campaigning. So how do we align operations, activities, and investments across time and terrain to generate effects? The effects are the why we're doing things. The effects are the, de the desired conditions for success that we generate continually to, gener to actually make the strategy live. You can see them here on the slide. They go from the tactical level all the way up to the strategic level, the whole government level that we have to be nested within. Down at the bottom with combat credibility, that's focus on the total force, mobility airmen, and their equipment. So that the wings, you're the face of AMC, not only to the joint force, but to the coalition force and to our commercial partners and our industry partners that we have here with us this week. Up in the middle, assurance. That's an effect. You don't assure somebody and they're assured. You do things to generate the effect of assurance. It's green and purple for a reason. There are multiple audiences and there are multiple ways of messaging and actually showing your commitments and your capabilities and your interoperability to generate that effect. 
and then we're, we're doing all of these things down towards the tactical level of warfare because they need to compound for a deterrent effect. So China says not today, right? We hear that all the time. They say not today or when crisis starts to escalate, we find off ramps to get back to the status quo that meet our interests. We will align operations, activities, and investments under three thematic lines of effort within our campaign plan design. First, demonstrating warfighting readiness. We need to be there on the actual terrain that matters. We need to be there at the right time with the right message, and we need to show certain capabilities. Advancing assurance and in, in interoperability. I'll give you a vignette here in a second on our next-gen capabilities and how we're approaching next-gen planning. But that is continual, and it's always been continual within this command. In maximizing gains in AMC capability and readiness, think tactics, techniques, and procedures, our weapons and tactics conferences, our lessons learned, not lessons observed, but lessons learned, and how we apply those lessons within the actual operational environment that we're going to encounter. So I told you that Gino Manahan brought us in and Fight Club, which is a cross-functional team, uh, emerged. What we ended up doing was going into the skiff with a lot of SMEs from across the staff and the wings as we got further in the timeline and learning the operation plan that matters based on the pacing threat as good as the theater to the point where we could go to staff talks and go to the theater to integrate with them because this is about air component level integration. So I told you I'd give you a vignette on how we're advancing capabilities and how we're advancing interoperability. You've heard the terminolo terminology next gen. We used to say CX and KCZ. I'm not saying that anymore. We're focused on a whole thematic theme of next-gen capabilities. The next-gen air dominance platform requires next-gen aerial support. We also have the NGAL. We have the next-gen AMAL and the next-gen AOC, which is closest to my heart as I sit in the AOC today. And you'll hear more about next-gen MAF operations, which is more of the detail and the how that we are campaigning um, tomorrow morning as part of that seminar. So with the next-gen AOC, what we're doing with that, just as an example, is we're looking at cross-competition as tempo changes and as scale changes, and we're determining how does the data that is relevant to make decisions change. When you look at tactical data, a lot of you execute that and interact with us in that manner. The mission data, think Form 59 and mission type orders, SMEAC, if you're f familiar with the joint terminology for that. And we're looking at enterprise data. That is the descriptive data that comes from over 25 systems that feed into your Form 59 in your mission detail. How does that change? Well, fortunately, we do this every day at the 618th as AFTRANS executing take on on behalf of US Transcom. And we ramp it up throughout competition. We learned a lot last August with the operations in and out of HKIA in Afghanistan. And what we're focusing on is as we go up in tempo, the reliance on unstructured data changes. So we need to figure out how to harness that data and make sense of it so we can communicate asynchronously. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I wake up in the morning and I go to my kitchen and I make my coffee, I have a personal assistant, which many of you might be able to relate to. Now the name changes. Some days it's Amazon, computer. Lately it's been Ziggy because my kids keep changing the name on it. But I can ask Ziggy, what's the weather like this weekend? And he can tell me it's going to be favorable on Sunday and not favorable on Saturday. I can also go back to Ziggy and say, hey, move the event I had on Saturday that's outdoors to Sunday and add it to the family calendar, which matters to me because I have eight kids and it's really hard to keep track of what's going on in our household. So what's happening there is unstructured 
data or language is going through a translator, an Amazon Echo, into the cloud environment, and there is artificial intelligence happening there to structure that data in a meaningful way, and then it's being put on a data lake for use later. Fast forward, I'm driving to work, and I forgot to tell my wife that I changed it because she's really not good at looking at the calendar. So I talked to Siri this time, that's on my iPhone, and I have Siri send a text message that is already formatted to go to her and go to my oldest kids that also have iPhones to tell them that we're, we're going to go to the pumpkin patch on Saturday versus Sunday. Now I tell you that story to kind of give you some context for what we're working at on with the AOC in terms of next-gen information technology for mobility readiness. It's nightmare, it's an acronym, it's marketing, but what we're talking about there is leveraging the tactical data so when logistic proce processes change, we can go ahead and make use of that data so we don't have to add humans to the floor at the TACC and communicate synchronously with you. We have a lot more detail on how we're gonna do that and we have it phased with proof of concepts at Mobility Guardian that I won't go into detail, but send us your questions or reach out to my team in SRD and we'll get you up to speed on where we're going and take your feedback. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it back to Colonel Shea and he's gonna talk in more detail about how we're closing gaps left of bang here with AMC Fight Club. Thanks, Gio. Good. I was focusing on those ways to advance capabilities that are gonna take us a little time. Those are things that require programming, identifying specific requirements making the advocacy at the headquarters Air Force, getting the other MAGCOMs as well as the Joint Force advocating for AMC as well, and the Mobility Air Forces so we can influence future programs and get those capabilities in our hands. It's still gonna take us a while. What I'm talking about right here is in that thing that it's a little more tangible to you and we can do right now. A lot of it is strictly a stroke of a pen to maximize what we've got to create combat credibility and start talking about things you've already heard today. Mission type orders, conditions-based authorities, and risk acceptance being better on understanding how to write those, how to get them into your hands now so you're able to make decisions and not wait. Operation Allies Refuge is one of those examples we learned from. Understood that, as General Alvin said, it, we worked too hard to do what we did because we saw something and we weren't ready for that. We didn't have that information in your hands at that time and that's what we're doing right now and thinking about it before the balloon goes up. That is what Mobility Fight Club is working on. Acknowledging that there's going to have to be higher risk acceptance and risk acceptance made at lower levels when appropriate and have that decision made, made, making matrix in your hands so you know what to do in those realms. And all those things are just writing. That is what the staff is trying to do right now to put these tools in your hands. It's what you're going to hear about more in the MAF Next Gen Operations, which is the second part of this brief. You can see that tomorrow. Additionally, you take a look at how we're going to present our forces. It's different, but we're implementing it already in October now. Force generation. This is how we protect the readiness that we need on a day-to-day -day basis in order to compete, deter, and if necessary, win in a high-end fight and give you the time and space to train, to work up to, and to validate and certify your ability as a unit and as a, um, and as a capability for the Mobility Air Forces to go and do that. You see there the force elements are generated. Understand that this is around the movements we need to do to create capabilities for the joint force and go out there. If we go to full high-end conflict with China, everyone's in the game and math or gen isn't going for it. This is how we protect our readiness on a day-to-day -day basis in order to get there, but also to, uh, to compete and deter daily. And take a look at that, it's a total force effort. It's not just Air Mobility Command. We rely on the National Guard. We rely on the Reserve Command, knowing that our capabilities are enhanced by our reliance within the total force integration model. As well, we rely on our civilian and commercial partners. Industry being here and us telling this story, talking about our gaps and the things that we need are part of this entire process of answering the question and closing gaps. It's an education for the total force. We already talked about it earlier today. You heard agile combat employment is what we must do. So understand you need to go out and learn exactly what we're gonna be doing. It's things we've been doing already, but there's exords and con ops that have been published. So as a leader, make sure your airmen know those. As an airman, thirst for those. Get the requirements that you are going to be asked to do. And this is gonna feed into the things that we do during Exercise Mobility Guardian, which you'll get to hear more about in a second. 
And that's a chance to try the ideas there and try new things. Talk about tanking. I'm an airlifter by trade, but I hear about anchors, sounds nautical, and the Western Pacific sounds like an anchor's going to the bottom of the ocean. And take a look at that first slide about the threat and the fact that China is targeting you and the mobility skill sets we have. I think it's time we change how we think about air refueling. Go look up Gunga Din. Air Force A-57's got a spectacular paper that relates Rudyard Kipling's poem about the water boy who goes to the soldier as opposed to the soldier coming back to the water hole when he needs it to think about a different way of doing air fueling. Just call it Uber tanker. Should know where the receivers are who have a demand signal and we go to them at the right time and they know the tanker's gonna be there when they need them. They don't have to say, where's my gas? It's right there. That requires connectivity. So closing one of those gaps Connectivity for both our air nodes and our ground nodes so you can execute under mission command. You can exercise condition-based authorities. But this is something that's going on already. This is one of those total force successes. National Guard KC-135s in Arctic, putting those in the cockpit now, which the active duty can then also leverage that capability and look at the programs going forward. But understanding how you plug into a larger war fight being part of the advanced battle management system like General Alden was talking about is a necessity if we're going to be connected and we're going to be relevant in that fight. On the other hand, that's again something we're going to build, there's stuff that's sitting out there right now. You take a look at the Boneyard and General Minahan talks about this all the time. There's a whole bunch of C-130s with fuel tanks sitting in there. It's 8,000 pounds of gas in each one of those tanks. That's three hours flying time for a Herc. Maybe that's an ability of a fighter to get up in the air. Let's get that capability to exist, put it in the hands of our airmen, and think about a smarter way of doing it. That's something the staff is working to get into your hands right now. On the other hand, maybe we go further back in the future. Take a look at that E6B in a contested environment. GPS might not be available. How are you going to find that island? You've got to remember the basics. The things have been trained. Don't throw it away because we got all the magic. Remember what we have and know that you can use those techniques, tactics, and procedures. And what are you going to do? You're going to go out and do things we've always been doing as mobility airmen. These pictures are supposed to represent multi-capable airmen, but you also heard it earlier this morning. Airmen have been doing this forever. And I honestly think the Air Mobility Command's kind of just set the groundwork. We take a look at contingency response, the global air mobility system. We've always been multi-capable. The concept now when we look at the pacing fight and what the staff owes to you, leaders owe to you and knowledge is what specific skill sets you must have when you're out there. So you can prioritize that training and get the right thing done when you're on that island, knowing that, hey, the maintainer must know how to use an AT. Or perhaps accepting risk that says, you know how to fuel that F-16 that normally you've never touched, but because we're in a particular phase of competition, deterrence, or conflict, it's okay for you to go ahead and do that. Because an airplane and a nozzle should connect and there's checklists and guidance that we should have in your hands so we're not making it up on the fly. And that last picture down at the bottom, you saw in General Minahan's brief as well. Been in the Air Force for 25 years. I have seen more airmen walking on maps in the last year of my life than I ever have. This is rehearsal. This is understanding what the plan is, what the requirements are, putting those things that you must do on a map, where you must go and how you're going to do that, that is what Mobility Fight Club is doing. And it's not the staff that's doing that. It's pulling in folks from the TFI, excuse me, weapons officers, instructors, NCOs, experts in multiple functions to come in and run and identify a winning scheme maneuver, which we're going to get to execute during mobility Gu exercise Mobility Guardian. But it's a matter of knowing and practicing and being able to do that as we roll in there. So we'll hear more about Mobility Guardian in just a second because I'm going to get us back to the campaign plan that Gio talked about, the science of how we campaign to align with the national defense strategy, the air mobility strategy, create effects for our command, create effects for the joint force. You put all the things we're doing together and you can start to align it. And this isn't everything we're doing and honestly it doesn't even accurately show how these things are related because we started putting the lines that connect to all these operations, activities, investments together. You couldn't see anything, but ultimately what it is, it's flowing up from the bottom, leading toward pacing events at the top. And I already was looking at the questions out there and asking, hey, how many people outside of math know about this? That's part of the maximizing and advancing. It's going to the other MAGCOMs, staff to staff visits. We've already done this with AFSOC, PACAF, AFMC, Global Strike, 
getting them to help understand our issues and help us understand their issues to be able to do that fight. And they can help tell the story on why the connected, survivable, and agile mobility force is gonna make them more effective. And it's not us just singing our own song for the heck of it. Talk about industry engagement, Marco and Polo. That's part of summer industry preview, bringing in the longer term view. And then going into the exercises, we've been integral parts of web techs and multiple commands. Next week, we've got a whole math contingent talking our scheme maneuver at the PACAF web tech. All these things are gonna inform that scheme maneuver, the short term things we're doing focused on this campaign to demonstrate our abilities to deter, assure, and create combat credibility, all moving up to, you see there in July and August, Mo Exercise Mobility Guardian 23, that's out there. But it's integrated to a larger process. Again, you get to hear more about this during MAF Next Gen Operations, that Mobility Guardian's already started. This is part of Mobility Guardian. Well, you'll get to hear that winning scheme maneuver in just a second, because the other part of campaigning I wanna make sure we touch on is we're not just doing this in a vacuum. We have to assess what we're doing to see that the effects that we're looking for from all these activities as they're linked and they're building to each other are happening like we expect, and if they aren't, then we change, or we get the feedback from the field, or we have you coming to the command to help this out. Because again, Mobility Fight Club is not just the A58, the A3, it's all of you as you come in. It's a, the staff has expanded, General Minahan loves it, and you hear more about that during the MAF Next Gen Operations. So, as we go to our pacing event and mobility, exercise Mobility Guardian in July, I want to bring on Lieutenant Colonel Jake Parker, the Director for Exercise Mobility Guardian 23, and Senior Master Sergeant Select Dan Campanella to tell you all about that. Thank you, sir. 7,800 miles. 7,800 miles is the distance of concern. 7,800 miles is the distance from Los Angeles to New York City, back to Los Angeles, all the way back to New York City. Now let's overlay that in the Pacific. That same distance is the distance from the west coast of the United States to Hawaii, to Guam, to the western edge of the Pacific. It's this distance that separates us from China. Good afternoon, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jake Parker, and with me today is Senior Master Sergeant Select Dan Campanella. We're gonna be talking about Exercise Mobility Guardian. But before we get started, who all here has taken part in rodeo in the past? Sorry, it's pretty bright. All right, so we got about five, six people. Okay. All right, how about Exercise Mobility Guardian 17, 19, 21? Okay, so we got about half of the, the crowd that's participated in, in a rodeo or some form of Mobility Guardian. All right, another question. Who has a negative connotation whenever you hear the terms Mobility Guardian, Air Mobility Command, Staff, or TACC. I know we got some crew dogs out there. I just came from squadron, so fully understand. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to bottle that negativity up, and let's put it to the side for now, because this is not your exercise of the past. And this is not the Air Mobility Command of the past. This command is transformed into the warfighting headquarters with the sole purpose of providing you as the warfighter, the tools necessary to win this next fight. Colonel Shea, Colonel Monaco did a fantastic job describing our next fight. They outlined the threat, described the AMC strategy, which was used to steer our objectives as an air mobility force to combat that threat. Additionally, they defined the gaps which exist and provided a roadmap for how you will fill those gaps as mobility airmen to compete and win. What Dan and I hope to convey to all of you today is how AMC's capstone event, Exercise Mobility Guardian, will have a strategic purpose focus on those gaps from planning all the way through to execution. So here's our problem statement. The joint force is not ready to fight and win in the Pacific. You ask yourself, why are we not ready to fight and how is it that we are not ready to win? Really, it boils down to a math equation. It's a distance plus location plus the current state of the joint force integration, which equates to an inability to deliver the combat requirements to win the next fight. We already spoke about the first one, which is a massive body of water that we must cross in order to bring our forces into any proximity to be relevant. With that distance comes the problem of where to put those forces. As depicted on the map, our options are limited, not only by size and support of these locations, but also by the first problem, the distance which lies between them. The remaining factor within this equation is the current state of the joint force integration. When we dissect this, we are measuring it by the need to be synchronized in purpose and messaging, as well as creating symbiotic relationships with our partners to strengthen our capabilities as a joint force. So when we say that part of the problem is the current state of the joint integration, we are defining in terms of how we must be integrated in order to deter any future adversaries. 
So what does all this mean? These three problems add up to mobility forces and ability to deliver combat requirements to win the next fight. And as General Menahan stated several weeks ago at AFA, if we don't have our act together, nobody wins, nobody's lethal, and nobody's in position. All right, so Colonel Parker just defined the why. Now we're gonna discuss how we go about delivering those combat requirements to win the next fight. And when we say deliver, we're talking all the functions of Air Mobility Command. It's the airlift, the air refueling, the air medical evacuation, the command and control, and of course, the global air mobility support. Mobility Guard in 2023 is all about the winning scheme of maneuver. And what it does as an exercise is it takes that problem statement on the previous slide and it demonstrates the winning scheme by developing and strengthening mobility air forces through the three core areas of speed, agility, and lethality. So as Dan just hit on speed, agility, and lethality, we're gonna break that down a little bit further. So first we're gonna focus on speed. How do we ensure we can rapidly deploy? How we've been postured to deploy is large heavy force elements which maximizes full operational capability at those fixed and static locations is not feasible for our operational requirements tomorrow. We need the ability to move at pace to ensure we deploy forces into theater to produce combat capability for the combatant commander immediately upon arrival. This will inherently come at a necessary risk in order to generate the tempo needed to win. Mobility Guardian 23 maximizes speed by reducing our operational footprint. It's right-sizing deployable forces to be light and lean. If I put munitions on a ship today, it's gonna to take approximately 30 to 45 days for those munitions to get into the Pacific. Now we take those same munitions, put them on the back of a C-17, and we'll get there in 18 hours. Rapid deployments are not feasible by sea. We need that speed in order to ensure we can outpace our adversary. And if we can't do it quick, it's not worth doing. That speed is brought by all of you. When we focus on agility, it's important to recognize we're no longer deploying to the CENTCOM theater anymore, to those static locations. The adversary during those campaigns did not possess the offensive nor the defensive capabilities our future adversary does. Agility is not only shifting our direction from east to west to focus on the Pacific, but it's also about shifting our attention to that new adversary and the problem set that comes with it. Agility also encompasses the mindset shift which is required to successfully demonstrate our capabilities in the Pacific. It's emphasizing that we need you, all of you, to be holistically ready to deploy to a theater which is constrained by that tyranny of distance, the limited basing locations, all of which creates a complexity we have not faced for 80 years. In many ways, CENTCOM inhibited our ability to exercise agility as a force. And we no longer have the luxury to deploy to those robust centralized locations with easily accessible logistical supply chains relying on safety nets. MG23's agility is being prepared and ready to move whenever and wherever the requirements exist for mobility airmen. Now we'll focus on lethality. Don't be surprised by that one. We've talked about it a lot last night and this morning. Everything we're doing is to increase and strengthen our lethality as a force. The effort is to balance it with quantity and quality and deliver it in a timely manner. It's capitalizing our agility maximizing our speed to project that unfair, unrepentant, lopsided lethality that General Minahan speaks to. All that rests on your backs. As part of Mobility Air Force, it's your skills and expertise that brings that lethality into a proximity of effectiveness at pace and at speed and at scale. Now let's give that some more purpose. Exercise Mobility Guardian is imperative to our future as a Mobility Air Force. From a planning perspective, we've taken that problem statement of the Joint Force is not ready to fight and win in the Pacific, and we clarified that problem by stating it's a matter of distance, locations, and the current state of Joint Force integration. Next, we defined our goals as the need to bolster and strengthen and further develop our speed, agility, and lethality. What remains is developing that action plan to solve the problem. And in order to do that correctly, we have to keep our strategy guidance centered so we can ensure that we're in line with the direction provided by our leaders. And as Dan just hit on strategy, Colonel Shea, Colonel Monaco also hit on strategy. We're gonna break it down for really the, the four vectors for persistent rapid global mobility within Air Mobility Command. Develop ready airmen and families, advance warfighting capabilities, project and connect the joint force and ensuring strategic advantage. What we've done is taken these four areas, or excuse me, the four vectors and expanded their essence into applicable focus areas in Mobility Guardian 23. These focus areas are the cornerstone 
for how this exercise will be measured for overall effectiveness, meaning they are more than just words. They must be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Additionally, we have highlighted four of our focus areas that fall completely in line with the CSAP's vision for culture change in the Air Force. Using both the AMC strategy and the CSAP's vision has driven the design of the exercise, enabling the Mobility Air Force to be at the forefront of reshaping how you continue to advance our nation's warfighting capabilities. All right, so we'll focus on the top left. In broad terms, developing ready airmen and families is leveraging tactical experts, building multi-capable airmen, and executing mission-type orders. Specifically, it's ensuring that airmen are getting the specialized advanced training that propels our force in the direction that's required. It's educating our airmen on the mission and the objectives at the lowest levels to ensure that if our force is disconnected or communications are interrupted, we remain synchronized in our efforts. It's also ensuring that members and their families are holistically ready for where we're headed, which is a different environment at an increased pace focused on a near-peer adversary. When we look at both advancing warfighting capabilities and projecting connect the joint force, we want to further expand and exercise our develop, development, excuse me, exercise and develop our ability to use current and emerging technologies to connect the joint force. It's taking aircraft and ground personnel and air operation centers recognizing their all nodes, putting them all on the same networks for expanded access and expedited reach back capability. It's also taking that crucial information, all the messaging, further into contested environments than we ever have before, to adapt the operation as we dictate, rather than allowing threats to determine how we must respond. All of this so we can better connect the warfighter, increase survivability, and advance the agility in the Pacific. It's synchronizing all the domains of joint operations. Lastly, the bottom right, Exercise Mobility Guardian is most certainly a partnership builder. We intend to interlock the exercise not only with our joint partners, but also with the allied partner, partner nations and the regional partners within the Pacific theater. By building these relationships, we advance our partners with synchronized training, objectives, and goals and we further expand our regional access to ensure strategic advantage in the Pacific. All right, now let's talk about the fun stuff. <clears throat> Exercise Mobility Guardian brings together mobility airmen with our joint force international partners, industry and commercial teams. Participants in this exercise will be tasked from units throughout Mobility Air Force fully integrating our total force airmen. Our time frame to execute is scheduled in the summer of 23 and as already stated, will be at locations throughout the Pacific. When it comes to how units are being selected for tasking, we are using the Air Force Force Generation Model as our guide. Those task units will then be placed throughout the Pacific based on their functional areas and where their capabilities are required. So how are we going to execute the most complex exercise this command has ever seen? Well, it's pretty simple. We're going to break it down into three focus areas, speed, agility, and lethality. One important thing to note, however, is that in order to execute these efforts, we have to set the theater prior to the launch of the exercise. We will utilize contingency response forces to build up some locations to enable the deployment of follow-on forces. They will be responsible to ensure that these locations are prepared to receive forces to include command and control force elements where applicable. Now moving into sprint one, the focus is on speed. Speed is paramount to get forces into theater quickly in order to outpace our adversary. Sprint 1 exercises our ability to rapidly deploy from the United States into the Pacific as that light and lean package previously discussed. The intent again is to generate combat capabilities immediately upon arrival. Additionally, as forces flow into theater, contingency response forces will begin transferring basing responsibility to those mission generation and command and control force elements. This will allow the contingency response forces to continue to advance to forward operating locations in Sprint 2. So Sprint 2 is centered around demonstrating our agility as a force. As we rapidly deployed in the theater and stood up those operating locations in Sprint 1, our focus now is to build up the forward operating locations necessary to continue to operationalize our agile combat employment capabilities further west. I would like to emphasize here that similar to how lethality is completely dependent on our execution of speed and agility, all of this exercise falls under this parent task, this umbrella, umbrella task of logistical support. It's the fuel, it's the food, it's the people, it's the aircraft parts, and getting it right is no small task. And that's a joint sustainment issue. 
And this is why simultaneously to our advancement of military assets to forward locations further west, we intend to exercise our commercial partners in order to help offset these logistical resupply requirements needed to sustain joint forces. They will backfill supplies by air to locations as far west as possible. And by incorporating commercial and industry partners into this exercise, which is already completely synced with joint and allied partners, we are maximizing our agility by leveraging all available resources. So as we focus on getting into theater quickly in Sprint 1 and the agility needed to operate in theater in Sprint 2, the Sprint 3 now has shifted to concentrating mass by maximizing operations tempo to test our surging capabilities. During this sprint, we'll be fully utilizing the hub and spoke concept to further demonstrate agile combat employment capabilities. We will test new and emerging technologies, demonstrate long duration flights, specialized fueling operations, as well as validating concepts such as mission type orders and condition based authorities in a calm degraded environment. So let's bring it all together. Throughout this briefing, we have linked strategy at the highest level to you as the warfighter. The focus is on deterring our adversaries, assuring our allies through the demonstration of your capabilities. The threat is real, the problem is complex, and each of you are integral to that solution. Truly, it all starts with you. Our ask is that you take the problem statement and the areas we are trying to develop and strengthen and bring these back to your units. Produce a solution that works best for your teams. If it's not clear, time is a luxury. And while AMC staff is working diligently to create the policies, procedures, and roadmaps to achieve our nation's objectives, we cannot afford to stall. Last thing I'll leave you with, probably the most important, Exercise Mobility Guardian is not just a two-week exercise. It's a transformative concept to break away from the status quo of yesterday. And you are fully empowered to help us to define tomorrow. Let's go. Okay. All right, so we got a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, since we had the opportunity of this uh, joint team right here to actually look at your questions beforehand, uh, some of them already got answers out there. They're still building on the last session as well. So I'm gonna hit one really quick and easy, then we'll get into a deeper one. I see I've got subject matter expertise down here. It's gonna help out too. So first one was, what's the strategic and tactical plan for integrating with PACAF mobility forces for the next fight with China and also with Mobility Guardian? Honestly, it's not just a fight with China, so just uh, understand that we are deterring Chinese aggression and really winning is never fighting. So just think about to start with. So talk about specific integration with the PACAF uh, mobility units out there. I hate to tell you, I've got to take that conversation up to a different classification level. We can't do it here. So find us afterwards. We talk. This is education. We want to be able to tell the story at a higher level with you and your teams uh, anytime you want. I didn't talk about it when I was going through the campaign alignment, but this is around the 60th time we've given this brief and this is only about the third unclassified version. So this is only a, the tip of the iceberg of what's going on and we are well integrated with them. The other part of that question was uh, participating in Mobility Guardian. We are engaged, we're going to PACAF uh, WebTAC next week talking about this scheme to have the PACAF mobility forces out there as well. So that's a relatively easy one. Now this question, you say that if war, war breaks out and AFWAR Gen isn't gonna cut it as everyone will be involved. So why choose to implement a bucket system versus just having more currency items and larger scale certifying events? So really what I want to kind of address again is ultimately AF4Gen is there to preserve your readiness because if we just made everyone operate at a higher level with more currency items, we don't have the time, resources, or money to do that, we're going to burn everyone out, else out and you're never going to get to that level because you'll be doing the day-to-day -day job every day. And I'll actually turn it over to my buddy over here, Colonel Andrew Campbell from uh, the A3 who can talk to that even more effectively than me. That's, that's Phil teaching me never, ever look at the other deputy A3 in the room and, and make any kind of gestures at all when Phil's answering a question. So, um, you know, the A4Gen is, we get that question a lot. What is the, the point of A4Gen? And uh, one of the things that is important to understand is that A4Gen is the Air Force's um, maturation of how we present our forces to the Joint Force and to OSD. And, and the way we posture ourselves to, to meet the enduring competition that we had ahead of us, while also readying ourselves for the type of conflict that we have not faced over the past generation that these guys just talked about. So, so we get the question sometimes, well, when we go to war, we go to war with the, the force that's in one of the four buckets, and that's not the case. We go to war with the entire force. 
But as we prepare for that and we set ourselves up for an enduring and long competition, as you read about in our competition campaign strategy, it's, it's the way we posture our forces and present them to the joint force and do that in a way where we can say, hey, we can give you one more when you ask for one more, but that one more is going to cost you readiness in the next phase and the one after and the one after. And if you keep asking us for one more, you're going to erode the readiness that we need to focus on through these kinds of things like Mobility Guardian to always have forces that are ready for this. And I'm going to sit quietly now so that this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. All right. I'll throw one other question out there, and this one's probably a little more complex. You've got a cross-functional team here, and there's a lot of folks on the staff who are thinking, so I'm not going to be able to give the best answer, but I'll give a perspective from GEO. As uh, ACC embarks on lead wings, A staffs, and A staffs running wing ops centers in one room type of C2, how's AMC getting after these objectives, and are they even thinking about the same? Decentralized AOC C2, right, left limits with mission type orders. So the first thing I'll say, it gets back to the idea that we want to address these things before they happen, not suffer through Operation Allies Refuge again. And that's what we learned from. And as we went into operations associated with Ukraine support, identifying how do we get better mission command and better mobility C2 out in the world early, we were pushing folks forward immediately in that one. There's other ComRail related topics that are under consideration in staff to staff discussions with AMC and PACAF. And there's other models being considered. I won't actually say decisions are being made on that. I saw General Cole come up. I don't know if he wants to say some words on that one. I think we'll offer up the uh, AMC A3. Love bringing in help. You actually answered it pretty well. Uh, so we all realized that to get Comrail done right, um, we got to relook at it. Um, so we have actually gone through what we think Comrail needs to look like in the future. Um, and then who we need to have in place at the various decision nodes across the battlefield. We've got our idea, we're gonna go out to PACAF Web Talk, we're gonna talk to the folks who we envision that fight with, and uh, there is a standing Comrail that we think can work, it just needs some more people. Um, the Wing A staff, it's under consideration. It's not the number one priority of this command, it's probably on a three-tiered system, I'd say it's number two. So we are gonna look at it, we're looking at some uh, models that are already in place at the 100th Wing out in Mildenhall, and 379th out at Al-Udeed, and the, the ones that have been already generated out of Air Combat Command. We'll take those in. We'll look at the best ones for uh, mobility air forces. Not an easy answer because every wing is kind of different, so every wing staff is not gonna be the same. We'll probably start and figure out what it looks like at what I'll call a normal wing, where it's a Travis Air Force Base or a Little Rock Air Force Base. And then we'll probably start working into the harder ones that are joint bases, uh, tenant wings, things like that. Thank you, sir. And uh, I hate to say we got about a minute and a half left here. So what I will do is if you didn't get your question sufficiently answered within the, uh, the Slido app, the whole team is going to sit down in front here in about two minutes after we take off these mics. We're happy to engage and talk to you. We want to the team to learn about these things and know that you are part of the Mobility Fight Club. Think about the challenges that are out there, what you can do to help advance the command and ultimately get into the capstone exercise, but even further, keep it going and keep on going on that one. Perfect, yeah. I got a 60 second one. There's a, a few questions about the 618th AOC. How are we preparing for the future fight? What is actually actionable? Okay, so two things on that. First of all, AOC Next, AOC 2.0, AOC Evolution, you've heard of that. It's very theater um, AOC focused. They're on the Falconer weapon system different suite of tools, different planning horizon, 72 hour air tasking cycle, 24 hour execution for an ATO from TBMCS. Different suite, different impact level, impact level six, 618th AOC, we plan at impact level five, which is a high end of controlled unclassified information. We execute in practice IL two, but we're gonna move that up to IL four. And our nightmare concept, see us afterwards, I have my lead engineer with me, We'll talk through, there was a question, how are we gonna actually do that? So we have an operational approach that has proof of concepts at Mobility Guardian next July. And so the things I talked about, harnessing data using Mattermost that's deployed in a platform one, cloud one environment at IL4 CUI, that already exists and we're on the commander's shot clock and we're gonna leverage it. And then our phase two, before we move into our next fixed facility, we'll be applying natural language processing on top of that aggregated data that we can structure in the cloud environment. That's all we got.
Thanks very much. All right, good afternoon. Hey, just a few things. First, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you all being here. Um, this is crazy, crazy important business. Um, and while there's a lot more depth and some limits to what we can share uh, in a venue like this, you know, it's, it should be entirely consistent with uh, uh, what you heard out of me at FA and what you heard out of me uh, certainly last night. I, it's always fun to watch a team grab it and take it to heights, uh, to, to heights that, that I don't have the capacity to do. To, to hear, the, hear the readbacks from the team is, is really cool. I'll make a, make a few more emphasis points here. The first would be, this is not just in the Pacific. All right, there is an enormous part of this that will occur in the Pacific, which is, which is unique uh, to the Mobility Guardian traditional way of doing it, but you don't have to be in the Pacific to get credit for Mobility Guardian. All right, so I challenged your weapons officers in a session this morning. I challenged your wing commanders in a session yesterday and I'll have a, a rally at Scott in a couple of weeks where I'll have the total force from the NAF commanders to the senior leadership of uh, General Healy and General Lowe, and I'll have all the wing commanders possible in front of the chief of staff of the Air Force, and I'm gonna, I am gonna firmly establish that, um, just as the briefers were saying, that you have a role in this and you are going to participate. Okay, you don't need a gray haired person telling you how to get after it. I see amazing things that happen without me having to say or utter one word. So there is, there is a wing level expertise that just needs to happen like it always does. Okay, so whether you're at Little Rock or the Northeast or the Southwest or wherever your base is, if you have a mobility role, you are in this. And Mobility Guardian is going on right now. The first operational Mobility Guardian movement was actually the ingress into ATA that happened at the International Airport uh, over the last you know, 36 hours. It's an enormous statement here. So do not take this lightly. You know, I did a, a roll call at McCord and I said, how many played, just, you know, just kind of was done here, how many played in the last Mobility Guardian and a handful of hands went up? You know, when we say that after next August, every hand's gonna go up, whether you are in the Pacific or not. So it's good. All right, so the last thing I'll just leave you with is another thank you. Open and, open and close with thank you. Thank you for the role you're gonna take. I have a need for you. If you wanna affect this, I have room for you on my team um, that can have a play. You can send a note to the team. You can send a note to me. I'll be upfront, I'm not a good pen pal. All right, you might get a TY, that means thank you. And that means the proper team has been CC'd or we'll take it and include you. If you want to come TDY, come TDY. If you want me to try to PCS you, I'll try to PCS you. If I can't do both of those, we'll remote you in. If I can't do that, I'll react to contact on your email. My expectation is to decentralize the planning and execution here. Okay? Decent, just like we're going to do when we're really fighting. Mission orders, you guys get after it. You guys are the pros. You figure it out. We'll have some broad guidance and then we'll get after the tactical excellence that can only come from you. We good? Everybody happy? All right, let's go. Thanks, team.